know this talk is addressed to the SAP London and a copy of the film will be given to our friends in Berlin. The centerpiece of this talk are the childhood drawings of a man who came to see me again when he was 63. First seen at six, then at 63, but once in the middle, and that was when he was in his 40s. He came for only two sessions, and the reason for it was that he was depressed, but mainly really feeling guilty when his father died. You will see in a moment why he felt guilty. The actual reason why he was depressed, the reason he gave, was he would have been so happy if he had seen how successful I was. Those were his words with which he came. He was very sad that his father didn't see his successes. And that perhaps is the beginning of what we are going to have quite a lot of the omnipotence and grandiosity of this patient, which has not changed since childhood. You will also see the reverse side of this particular coin, which is his enormous feeling of being weak and powerless vis-à-vis -a, -vis a woman. Now, I go on to very quickly talk about the patient's parents. I met them both at the Middlesex Hospital, outpatient department Cleveland Street, a teaching hospital, it will all have changed. And at this, to this place, his mother had brought him because of the symptom, which was endoresis at six. The mother was a powerful woman in the sense of that she had a lot of drive, which his father did not have, because the father was a small man, a tailor, who had come to England from one of the eastern countries. And my patient remained the only child of this marriage. I can't do more than give the impression of the parents, but it is very important when we come to the pictures. Now, the course of the sessions during which the pictures were produced was absolutely repetitious. That is to say, I couldn't get a word in edgeways. He would draw, and these pictures are selected out of 13, which I kept at the time to talk about today. Uh, and the 13 were, again, a selection out of, I should say, well over 100 because he did nothing but draw during the sessions. If I, for instance, tried to interpret what he was doing, what we call the transference, he would not listen at all, not respond, but produce more and more drawings. I would say, for example, you're producing so many drawings in order to keep me quiet. No response. I can't say anything to you. Drawings. Nothing. Straight on. And I come to this straight path in a moment when I want to talk, or just refer to the psychology of genius. Because I have very little doubt that this boy was 
and became evidently a genius. He is a scientist and now I must be extremely careful to preserve anonymity so don't please ask me anything more than what I say about him. Uh, he is a scientist and a physicist whom two of the most famous universities in Cambridge have built special laboratories. He's got the membership or fellowship of all important scientific societies in England, including the most famous one. He's got five professorships. He's got fellowships to the uh, university colleges. But his real money comes, don't be surprised, from industry. So he told me in the usual modest way that he had houses everywhere. Uh, in the, university towns in London, and so on. Uh, in other words, how rich he was. And uh, he also looked at my paintings, uh, which were in the room where I interviewed him. But he came in November 2006, and he looked at the pictures and said, uh, could I buy any? <laughs> and I laughed and said, they're not for sale, uh, which somewhat disappointed him. Uh, like he was also disappointed when I said, uh, in answer to his questions, what he owed at the end of the session, I, I, I told him there was no fee but it was my only weapon against his omnipotence. So, I'd like to talk about the pictures now. I'll start talking about them. Uh, you've seen them. So the first one shows not only aggression, but I think uh, a lot of sadism with it. This phallic animal, the elephant, squirting water, I suppose, uh, against the genitals of his opponent. Uh, this picture is just one of very many which show that particular theme disarming the opponent, tying him to a chair, or her. Didn't seem to make any difference at that stage. Uh, can we have the next? Yes. Uh, is this the boy or the girl? This is the girl. Yeah. Uh, you see the girl Martians. She is doubly armed with sharp pointed breasts as well as a penis. I pause a moment because it takes some time to take this picture in and to remember it as we talk about it later. Contrast this picture with the boy Martians. You've seen the girl Martian, now you see the boy Martian. You see how incontinent and helpless he is compared with the girl Martian. She's continent. He's incontinent, she's armed with penis and breast, he's helpless. 
And you notice also in this drawing that there is a hand coming in at one side, which I suppose was mother's hand holding the potty in which he is, I think, shitting or urinating, I'm not sure. The contrast between the two could hardly be greater. Now, in order to compensate for all this male inferiority, the patient invented a superman, as he was customary in the comics for children, which appeared most particularly as an accompaniment of the Sunday papers. But you could buy comics at any time. And Superman, oozing power, he winged, of course, a formidable figure. And I think in symbolism the patient has taken Superman up as the banner for his career. Success everywhere. Opposition, no. But Superman, here or there, it doesn't matter, the great mother, thank you. the great mother catches Superman with her lasso and he is now imprisoned in her body. The other little structure you see in this vast body is an oval. I don't know how he called it at the time, I've forgotten. But clearly he had an idea of biology already. No stalks that brought babies for him. So from there, from these pictures, and we get them out again if we want to discuss them. I go, I've already mentioned the 40, uh, around about 40 age sessions. Now we can come to the one at 63. And the first puzzle is, how did he find me? Quite simple for him, of course. His words, thanks to the wonders of web and an aerial map which I got of your house, I found the way quite easily. This was an answer to my having tried to give him instructions how to get from Tager Airport to my house. It was of course totally unnecessary. This puny effort of mine to give him directions. So he arrived ten minutes before the appointed time and I saw 
fairly tall and very broad-shouldered man who looked his age. And he greeted me and told me that uh, he had uh, other business to do in Berlin anyway and so he just came to see me. In the course of the interview, however, he made one slip there. I said at the end, uh, so flying straight back, uh, he told me he had some business in Berlin. No, no, I fly straight back. So he didn't want to say that he had come and gone only for the sake of this interview. He had, for one moment, he said he had other business. Uh, I was just part of the coming to Berlin. Asked at the end of the interview, I already told you what my fee was and my reply. So he asked, uh, Can I come again? I said, Of course. But I think he only, he did not mean it. I think he just said this as a polite way of saying goodbye after I waved my fee. One very important point of the interview which I left out so far. I asked him about his marriage. Everything like everything else was all right. As this was a once-off interview and I couldn't conduct it like an analytic session, not asking any questions, I had to ask a question about sexuality. And uh, his answer was again unequivocal. I said, how about intercourse? And his answer, what you guess, regularly. <laughs> I did not ask which night. But his wife, like the superwoman, did not really, and that was one reason for coming, the most important perhaps, because, my words now, she refused to obey. In practice this meant that she stayed in the place, I won't mention, uh, outside London, where she worked, and stayed quite often overnight and only came home for the weekend. It would have been a journey at the end of a long time, a long day, but at any rate, she did not obey. And then I asked the last question, does your wife know that you came today? No. I said, why didn't you tell her? It would have meant a great victory to her, was his answer. And my reply, which may have been, may have been uh, bearing fruit, was, wouldn't it be better to go in for peace than for defeat or victory? That was about, other than waving the feet, uh, about the last thing in the session. There came about 
Two months later, a letter from the patient to say that there had been further successes, that he had been asked to build up an institute of physics and that his working time, normally limited in England in, for men to 65, I think it's the same here, uh, had been extended to the age of 70. So once more it was confirmed here was a genius. All the distinctions he received, no single failure in any field, and most important of all in this letter. He said, we rub along quite well together now, he and his wife of course, and even good humouredly, and we have our separate social activities. So I must be very careful having this one case in mind not to become swollen headed uh, because this was more than success, this was magic. I had worked apparently and it's quite difficult to divest oneself of this aura of being as successful as the patient himself was, a kind of infection. So that's about all I have to say and I'd love to discuss, if at all possible, any kind of picture, question, anything about this case. I'd be, I would be grateful for a bit of discussion because, as I said at the beginning, this film will be shown in London and I will get discussion from there, I'm sure, of per telephone on the evening of the 12th. Okay. One question that uh, comes to me first, and this is uh, the one about being, being lonely. I mean, Superman is a very lonely figure up in the yeah. sky, rescuing people and vanishing again. And how about this man? Uh, was there any other way overcoming his being lonely than fighting? I mean, to fight is, is, one, is one way to, yeah. to overcome this, to say, hey, you're my opponent and I'll show you that I'm the big one. And, uh, but what comes after? Or is there anything else? Yeah. Yes, I think he is lonely almost by definition because there is nobody who can really debate what he knows uh, about his job, about his particular uh, branch of science. It, it is, uh, let's say, it's equivalent to atomic physics. And there aren't so many people who are versed in this. At any rate, you can see from his behavior with me that he really stamps out anybody who can talk to him in his way. And I have not, I don't know whether he's got anything that we ordinary mortals would call a hobby. I don't know, but I, I can't imagine it, and I, 
did not ask him, I asked him one important question and uh, so I didn't ask that. But I imagine, yes, yes or no. And she so depended really on the company of his wife. Yeah, mm. okay, okay. Uh, there are no children, I suppose. I, I also asked. There are two daughters, not surprising, and all he said about them is that they have got very good positions. Mm. Jobs. Sorry to hear that. In yes. that case. <laughs> <laughs> They've grown up, of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, may I stimulate the discussion by saying what I would like to discuss with you is, first of all, who am I? Who am I? I obviously am not that weak and nondescript father perhaps compensatory to that father, but I think my function in this man's mind is what Jung calls the psychopomp, psychopompus, the, uh, the accompanier of souls the job of Hermes, and uh, I think I'm the projection of this mythological figure, because I'm always there, my longevity is eternal, like all stereotypes or what you call archetypes, I'm there forever. And this also applies, strangely enough, while I'm on the point, to uh, somebody I saw after only 40 years. They don't question, I, I, at 95 I might long have died, they don't question it, that I'm there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other point of discussion which I would like is the psychology of genius uh, in a way that uh, it seems to me that you can't analyze genius. Freud, for instance, could not be analysed. Jung could not be analysed. It seems to me that a genius carries a programme and that they go to the target like an arrow from a bow, straight on, nothing will deflect them. Once they are on their program. There's nothing more to be done, and certainly no analysis can intrude on it. But excuse me, do you think he knows that he is lonely? Uh, did he has a feeling of his loneliness and depression? No, not Maybe at sometimes all. The only depression depressing? that was allowed was about his father's death, because lonely. he would have been. But good that you ask this. He prays for the soul of his father every week, well, once a week. That's a way of atoning, in my view. And maybe he thinks about you also once a week, <laughs> maybe. 
I think people well, just think of me occasionally, or perhaps more often. I don't know. Uh, do, uh, do you think he? Do you think he ever had a bad conscience as a child, uh, for because he went to you and uh, painted and uh, did these drawings with you? Because I remember when I was a child, and I very often looked for other mothers. Huh? They, I was cross with mine, and then mm -hmm. there was this lady and that lady, and I think when. I got more or less emotionally attached to. I always had a bad conscience about, your and mother. about my mother, and I had the impression, I mean, it must not be true, that she sort of sniffed that. And she, in a way, she knew it. And this was always something that very disturbed between the two of us because there was this young lady in the house whom I. <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah. so I, I think I wonder whether he perhaps had also a bad conscience with his father yeah. because of going to you every week, uh, doing the paintings and so on. No? Yes, yeah. so. I think so. Of course, the uh, rivalry between daughter and mother, particularly if there's also a father about, is. Uh, a proverbial, a, a stereotype mm. thing, but uh, I'm glad to hear <laughs> a, a living example of it. Yes, yes, this bad conscience, but of course his bad conscience about the father was something uh, magnified to the last extent with the praying every year the father died 23 years ago well, 20 years ago and he still prays for his soul there can be no question about the guilt feelings father or in the other direction that he hadn't saved him oh, other than that that he hadn't saved him to me the whole story comes like that yes uh, father I'll prove that we too we are strong mm -hmm. yes well I'll save the world I'll become a big shot mm. and so you will be all right yes yes Well, my uh, impression of the actual father is so uh, uh, strongly in, uh, on the side of how can he have been potent that uh, apparently he I was going to say, or oh, his wife, <laughs> were uh, potent and uh, and how? <laughs> and, and but I wondered whether you, I mean, you're in the plural. Uh, ever had the uh, feeling that in treating a patient there was something of genius which I sort of defined ad hoc for uh, someone totally programmed that you couldn't get into. Uh, uh, that 
you can't get into a relationship with a patient can have more than the course which I've called the genius program. But uh, you may have had the feeling, I mean, uh, it needn't be physics, it could be music, it could be any of the arts, could be any of the sciences. I think the only uh, thing which does not, uh, which is not part of this program, is that he comes to you and he wants to see you, and uh, this must be a yes. thought in this program that yes, indeed, he thinks about you and he comes to you. Yes, when he thinks about me, mm. when he fails to get satisfaction from his wife. What he had a feeling that uh, I think helpless would not be too strong a word that he could not get her to do what he wanted. I mean, he is omnipotent with this one exception mm. and perhaps I can arm that out. Mm -hmm. But instead of earning it out, I uh, helped him to find peace, which is, uh, I was lucky. That they have their separate social activities, I think, that he allows her to have that. and not to have to come home if it doesn't suit her, is quite astonishing. Do you think you provided him with a model of a strong man who could allow the woman's separateness? And if you said that, as um, another superman, then that was okay? Yes. Well, I think as long as he remains ultimately the superman, mm. he'll be quite tolerant of lesser geniuses. <laughs> and I think a very important, not only materially important uh, point for this patient is that he got recognition not from all the societies, not from all the universities, but from industry, where the money is. Because that, as we all know, is a power yes. which one from town to town, envies. Mm. Well, this is announced in the picture number number nine, I'd say. Number? Number nine. Yes. Well, the incontinent boy. Yes. That's where power comes from. It's not a spirit, but it's yes. another part of the body. Mm. Yes. If he only knew what we as analysts can see, that apart from Superman, he's only a boy Martian. Yeah. With the helping hand yeah. for his ship. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I, I'd like to, if at all possible, 
to come back and ask you this question that the best therapeutic, not analytic, but therapeutic results are achieved by unresolved positive transferences. That's in, in very short cases people one sees once and not again but cannot answer that question about the transference. If they came again, one could. Of course, Freud also distinguished between therapeutic and analytic results. And the analytic result is to do my definition now uh, with an enrichment of the psyche and of life and nothing of that depends on the disappearance of symptoms. I think it's a, it's a very important and very often a clear distinction, except uh, that I think one couldn't be an analyst for very long if one did not sometimes have a symptomatic cure. The analytic result, in my view, is comes very close to being having acquired a philosophy of life, a philosophic attitude towards life. And the symptomatic cure very often remains totally unenlightened. But, as in the case of this man, I would say, what of it? He's happy. He's got a relationship at the moment with his wife. What enlightenment does he require? I could easily say, answer it if it were me. And I knew it, I would, I would hate to remain stuck with a, a symptom-free life, nothing else. I was wondering how he must have felt <coughs> when he was six and he was brought to a hospital to see you because of his... Yes. Bedwetting um, and the humiliation of that, yeah. and how if he was on a Superman trajectory, what an assault that must have been on uh, his uh, what a, an assault yes, yes. on his self-esteem that must have been, and perhaps <coughs> um, meeting you who had no such problems yes. um, may have spurred him on almost. Um, with yes. his efforts, which you experienced, to show that he was not yes. someone who could be got down by um, problems that other people seemed to feel were needed res resolution. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, you're quite right. If he had thought that I could see through the Superman mask, he would not have come. Mm. So he mistakenly <laughs> takes me for somebody who stands in awe 
and admiration for his achievements. But it's just this belief which I wanted to undermine by not charging any fee. Mm -hmm. He would have loved to buy my pictures and to buy me mm. with an enormous fee. Mm. And I think you could perhaps blame or at least criticize me for not having fitted in with this world. Because if I were really, I, I felt you probably can hear it too, some antagonism towards this I can buy the world attitude. Have you ever had a patient like that, Regina? Working with children, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm. Yeah, not necessarily as a child, because uh, half of what I said is referring to childhood, but actually to his achievements and grandiosity, which remained unresolved. I couldn't say so, but I don't believe so. Not to that extent, perhaps. I envy, uh, or used to envy, no, no longer because I'm no longer in the game, uh, those uh, analysts who had famous patients. <laughs> so I'm really asking, did you have a famous patient? Famous in the world? Not really. Not really. No? I work with children and children, I, yes. and I children. children there to become famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. Maybe I did not ask the question. Uh, for me, it's not so important if they become famous. Uh, important uh, if they yeah. become lucky. Yeah. But I think there are a lot of children with this problem. Mm -hmm. They want to dominate <coughs> the analytic. They want uh, to. <laughs> not to be in the weak uh, and depressive position. Mm. They want to, to, uh, to answer you. Yeah. They only want to, um, to say what you have to do. Yeah. I think there are a lot of uh, children with this problem, or a lot of yeah. adolescents also. Um, I think it's uh, this, this type of... Uh, Patient is, I think, often. Yeah. We, we, find, we find it often. Mm. Yes, I'd say too, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And then uh, it's, uh, it's always a question what kind of transference is it? Mm -hmm. And uh, more than often, I, I found that, mm. that, was, that, that there was no real transference to be found because, speci especially when working with children, I had the chance to see both of the parents, sometimes mm. the grandparents, yeah. and so on, and <coughs> uh, nothing really fitted. Mm. And uh, so I uh, often had the uh, had the had the feeling that I was uh, addressed like a like a, a special type of uh, distinguished audience. You know, Superman has to have his audience. Mm. Well, admirers. Uh, admirers. Uh, yeah. At least, after all, well, when he when he when he uh, flies through the skies and everything, a Superman he yeah. again he saved us. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I did not uh, fear that this man had friends and admirers. I mean, in in one that yeah, he was yeah. friendly towards admirers, that he had a close friend at all. Mm -hmm. So, come back to lonely, yes. 
Yes, some, uh, yes, some of them, I'm, I'm afraid he, he won't have any. Well, uh, to, to talking about Superman, uh, Superman, the, the figure, he's, lo he's lonely. He's, he has, uh, his, his double identity, he's a, he's a man with, a, with glasses, a collar, and, uh, and a suit all day long, and, uh, but from time to time he just strips it all off and uh, then he yeah. becomes Superman. Yeah. And uh, another figure in comic literature, Batman, he's different. Batman, yes. Batman is a friend. He's a, it's, no, it's, it's more, yeah. it's, it's a kind of son. It's Batman and Robin. Mm -hmm. And Robin knows all of his secrets and he is an admirer, but he's a, he's a growing up, well, and uh, he, he, Batman has a chance yeah. to live all his adventures together with Robin. Mm -hmm. And they both have the, the admirance of, of uh, all the world. But yes. This is a different a difference. That's uh, uh, that's one step forward, I think, from Superman to right. Batman. Yes. But I'm afraid your your patient he hadn't found his Robin yet. No. Yes. Superman can never be in a relationship, can he? In Not really. all yeah. the films, the yeah. the relationships yeah. collect right. him down. And uh, although he described the present, the the last. Uh, relationship with his wife has been apparently satisfactory to both. What I could not feel is that this man had any warmth. Mm. Yeah. Even his uh, guilt and his prayers for his father were maybe that was me, a formality, a kind of ritual exercised against the feeling of having killed him. Yes, maybe, maybe this is one of the main problems. Well, uh, I think People, people like like your patient, they, they don't have the ability mm. to exchange feelings and to have the same feelings like the other has. But because in this moment uh, uh, they they might have the feeling to be swallowed again. Yeah. Well, we both have the same feeling, and suddenly you have my feelings, yeah. and then I I end up in your tummy. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well. Mm. So to come back to this, but I, I think it's fairly rare in children uh, that boys really regard girls as being superior. Not as adults, not looking back, but at the time when they are children, that because girls are girls and equipped like that, they regard them as superior. Usually, uh, I mean, it's more usual for boys, or at least, to say, only a girl, you know, I mean, inferior. <laughs> So the girls were competition. Uh, yes. A further stimulus. Uh, yes, but the pretense is a girl cannot be in competition because she has got a penis. Here she has. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I was uh, thinking of what you usually find mm. in child analytic practice mm. on, on the surface. The, the girl is inferior, but beneath the surface, the surface perhaps, is the boy who is inferior, who is incontinent, who cannot grow up. What is for you the reason for this uh, psych psychical development? Why is this? Uh, what's the reason for, yes, for, for this, this development? Yes. Uh, 
where if I have to find a reason other than the program, uh, I would say being an only child of a powerful mother and uh, an extremely non-entity of a father. So, mother is evidence of mm. of this continent, equipped with penis and purse mm. figure. Mm. And uh, another question: In Germany, uh, the analytics work usually also with the parents of the children. Yes. In such a case, did you work also with the mother and with the father, or maybe with the couple? Uh, no. Uh, this was strictly divided, and uh, even looking back, I'm glad of this division. The mother, occasionally the father, was seen uh, at this hospital set up by the social worker, while I only saw the child, and very occasionally. The social worker and I exchanged what we had learned or what we had observed. But uh, I was always glad that I didn't have to see a parent when I concentrated on the child. And there my uh, forward, my guiding model, was Winnicott because uh, I did not only know him and meet him socially, but he was also the analyst of my younger son. And he, I don't know whether I would have done that, corresponded with me about what he had, about the sessions with my son. So they regarded me, even in that situation, more as a colleague than a father. Whether this was right, uh, whether I would have done that, I doubt it. 